am with Pure Air Filtration. Uh, my name is Paula Westmoreland. I'm the Industrial and Commercial Market Sales Manager. Um, I've been in this industry for about 22 years. Um, and uh, we're going to start talking about our PFU units, which is our standalone units. So what we're going to talk about today is a little bit of an introduction on what who we are, who pure, pure air filtration is, um, our gas filtration, gas, fil uh, gas phase filtration, uh, how to create a full solution and standard practices, different types of equipment that we use, and then we're going to go into details into the PFE units. Um, and talk about the markets, how it's used, uh, configurations, overview, benefits. And then we'll have a little bit of uh, basic room design on how to use the PFUs and a few case studies. So who, who is Pure Filtration? Uh, we've been in the market for about 20 years. Uh, we, manufact we have a manufacturing facility here in Georgia, uh, in Atlanta. Uh, we have uh, more than 40 employees at this time, and we do sales internationally uh, over 50 countries. Uh, we are a single source manufacturer, and what does that mean? That means that we do our gas phase system. So our equipment is made by us. We make our chemical medias. And then we do the monitoring systems to take care of all those uh, problems and make sure that after we have a solution, that the solution is maintained and kept up and things are still working uh, in, a good, in a good way. Uh, we ISO 9001 certified. So if anybody needs uh, that certification, we have that. Uh, we sell into multiple markets and applications. So it goes from commercial, industrial, wastewater, and within those markets, there's multiple different applications in there. Uh, we customize our solutions, meaning a lot of times, a lot of the units that we do make are one of. Uh, we do have standards, but and they usually go off of that standard for the unit but usually different, especially on the industrial side is very specific for that customer. So between in between the type of equipment that we use to the type of media that we put in that equipment, how many passes we put in that equipment, everything is made for that customer specifically. Um, we have multiple families of absorbents, uh, which means all of our medias, we have carbons, we have engineered carbons or engineered media. Um, so depending on what kind of application, what kind of contaminants are out there, uh, we're going to figure out what is the best media to use for that solution. And sometimes we'll have to do blends or we have to do two or three different passes of media to be able to uh, take care of the problems. Um, we also monitor the absorbent consumption, so there's different ways to do that, and we're going to show you that um, later on. And then also after we figure out the solution, we implement the solution, then we can monitor the media, uh, the life of the media that is being used because we want to make sure that uh, the media doesn't die and you're not being protected. And we also have a laboratory testing uh, for our samples, for our customers. Uh, so any media that we do manufacture, we can do laboratory testing to figure out what's, um, what's the life of the media that's left. Um, some of the customers, the notable customers that we might have, this is just a few. We have ExxonMobil, uh, International Paper, Christie's uh, Auction House, uh, Belgian Brewery, Archives, numerous municipalities. So as you can see, uh, as I was talking before, there's different markets and different applications that we uh, touch. So what is gas phase filtration? What do we do is gas phase filtration? What is it? 
So there's different types of filtration. There's solid filtration, there's liquid filtration, and gas filtration. Uh, solid filtration is your dust and smoke. Uh, liquids, you're going to have, you know, uh, vapors and aerosols. And gas is what we take care of it. So gas is 0 0.0003 and 0 0.02, 0 0.007 microns. What is a micron? It's one millionth of a meter. So compared to a human hair, uh, human hair is 100 microns. So the size of a molecule for gas is a lot, lot, lot smaller. Um, so it's the removal of harmful toxic gases from the air. That's what we do. Um, so hydrogen sulfide, sulfuric acid, chlorine, sulfur dioxide, HCl, there's tons of gases out there. Um, and sometimes we get asked uh, by a customer is which ones this media will take care of it. It, it is so many that we cannot say uh, or name them, but if you tell us exactly what your problem is, we can tell you. We can tell you exactly what the media is going to be, and if you can tell us how often you that unit is going to be used and how much you get uh, gas you have, then we can give you a life uh, predictable life of that media. What's going to be? So the gas phase filtration is the process of using specialized filter media and chemical substance to remove pollutants from the air. That's what we do. So, and I'm this. I'm touching in things that we always talk about because that is the base of what we do. Um, and then I'll go into detail on the unit itself. So, uh, again, gas phase filtration. What is that? Is the filtration of uh, gaseous phase? So, there's two types of filtration. Uh, gas phase filtration. Adsorption and chemisorption. So adsorption is more like a sponge. So when the gas touches that sponge, it's going to sit around that uh, media, uh, is going to hold on to it, um, but it's not going to change the, the media itself. It's not going to change that chemical, that, that contaminant itself. It's just going to sit there and then if something happens to that um, area, like if you have a lot more uh, humidity coming through, it actually desorbs. So that's what happens to adsorption. Uh, it's mainly activated carbon or, or activated car uh, charcoal. Chemisorption is what we try to do most of the time. Uh, and the reason for that is that the chemisorption is the process that's specific uh, and the, dependent on neutralizing chemical, um, and it changes the chemistry inside of that molecule of the contaminant. So the chemisorption is permanent and irreversible. So you might ask, so why do we use activated carbon sometimes? Well, it, it's all a chem chemistry thing. Uh, some chemicals do not do well with chemisorption, so they, they do not work for that. So we still do have to use activated carbon for that. Um, but the, the more, the amounts of contaminants that we have, the types of contaminants that we have, uh, anytime that we can use a chemisorption process, we'll do that. And sometimes we'll do a combination of So the difference between carbon and engineered media or chemisorbent medias. So carbon by itself is not UL certifiable. And the reason it's not UL certifiable is because it actually can catch on fire. Um, the engineered media, we can, it is UL certifiable and it is not uh, hazardous. Um, after it's used, and it's most likely will not catch on fire. Uh, so carbon is also an equilibrium driven, and that's what I was talking about in regards to um, uh, when you have a lot of humidity in the air, if the, the humidity molecules are much bigger than the molecules for the gases, what happens is whatever um, 
gases that the media, that carbon is holding, when you have humidity in the air, is going to desorb. It's going to let go of that gas, and then you're still going to have that problem. With engineered media, it's an irreversible process. Uh, changes on the gas are going to happen. It is not going to reverse back to a contaminant. Um, so carbon can be hazardous when you waste when it's spent because exactly because of that. So when you're trying to get rid of the carbon that you have in your units, uh, activated carbon, I mean, um, you might have some issues with waste management in regards to disposing of that. Uh, engineered medias, you're not going to, that's not going to happen because most of the engineered medias after that process is done, the what you're going to uh, dispose of it is non-hazardous. Uh, therefore, it's, it's a harmless solid, not toxic. So those are the benefits of one versus the other. But again, you're still going to have to use carbons if you do VOCs, um, and there those are like benzene, toluene, xylene, all those uh, engineered media is not going to work well for it. Media, this is what we do the best. Uh, we have numerous types of medias and the combinations of medias uh, to go after specific gases. So we have our activated alumina impregnated with potassium permanganate. Uh, we have a 4%, a 8%, and a 12%. We have our plain activated carbon, those the ones that I was just talking about that will go after VOCs. Uh, so we have plain activated carbon made out of charcoal, and then we have the coconut base uh, activated carbon. The engineered carbons, those are other carbons that we use for ammonia and high concentrations of H2S, especially on the wastewater side and things like that. Uh, we also have the mineral base um, medias, and then we have all the blended medias that we can do with either activated carbon, engineered carbon, and the impregnated carbon um, for that. And for our emergency gas scrubbers, uh, which is mainly chlorine, uh, we have our safety sorb. So, you have um, the first thing that you're going to do when you're trying to talk to a customer is figure out what the problem is and what is the best solution to figure out how to take care of their problem. So the things that we need to, to know um, to make sure that we have the perfect solution or the best solution for them is to find, first of all, what is the type and the level of contaminants that they have. So those are the first questions that we're going to ask you uh, or the rep or the customer or the engineer of, you know, what is the problem? Explain the problem to us. What is the specific, uh, how is the, is it odor issue? Is it a corrosion issue? Is it, um, you know, just what what's going on with that application? Uh, the other things that we need to worry about is temperature and humidity. Uh, the airflow, uh, the or the volume of and the frequency of the airflow. If it's a room size that you're trying to to contain and clean, uh, what kind of building you have? Are you trying to do pressurization or recirculation? And I'm going to touch base on that a little bit at the end. Um, and then we also need to know about space restrictions. Uh, I can have the best solution for you. But if the my unit, the unit that I'm planning engineering to put in that room or put in your facility doesn't fit, you can't use it. So we need to know that ahead of time so we can figure out if the unit is going to be a vertical unit, it's going to be a horizontal unit, it's going to be inside or outside. All those things are important pieces of information for us to figure out what's the best solution for the customer. Um, is there going to be people in there? In the in the location that we're trying to clean, um, is there going to be people people going in and out of that location? Is are you trying to clean a room for people to go in there as a safe room uh, in case of an episode? So all those those pieces of information we need to know, and then particular fil filtration uh, that may be needed. Uh, so if you are in in a uh, 
chemical plant that there has a lot of dust outside, we definitely need to make sure that we have a particular filtration in front of our, our chemical media just to protect the media from getting, you know, uh, blind by all the, the dust. And also, if you're throwing uh, the air, clean air inside of a room, uh, there will be a little bit of dusting that happens at the beginning of the use of our media. Uh, so you just want to make sure that that's clean before it goes into the clean air facility or a room or whatever. And then also the continuous monitoring of the air after you figure out what that solution is for the customer. So those are the things that to consider. Um, sometimes we ask a lot of questions. We're not trying to be mean. All we're trying to do is make sure that we have all the information to come up with the best solution for the customer. So some of the things that we do and some have done like on monitoring and media testing, I'll, some of these things are done prior to um, figuring out what a, the best unit to put the make the solution for. And sometimes this is done after the fact to make sure that whatever solution that we put in there is still being uh, worked on and st still being used properly. So our corrosive test kits, those are this one right here. You have copper and silver strip. And what that tells you is uh, the amount of corrosion that's in there. That gives us an idea of uh, what kind of equipment you need. Um, it will not give us the exact gases that you have problems with, but it's going to tell you how bad the environment is or, or if you don't have a problem. Uh, the same thing with the ECM. This is our environment corrosivity monitor that's going to show the amount of corrosion uh, in the environment. So this is real time data um, and it also reads temperature and humidity and pressure. So it provides that information via you know, the screen or via a graph uh, on your computer. And then you have uh, our new EBM. Uh, this is also a electronic uh, uh, indicator that is going to tell you, ask you put the unit out there you, it's going to tell you how much of that uh, unit is, how much of the media is being used. So it's actually going to give you reports and it's going to give you readings on um, how much of the media has been used. Therefore, you will know the intervals of when you're supposed to change the media. And we also have the manual um, media bed indicator. This is just a physical indicator that is as the air uh, going through that unit starts breaking down as the media gets older and used, then it will corrode that rod uh, and it will give an indication that you're about, you need to change the media when you need to change the media because of the media change color in there. So air scrubbing equipment. So we talked about a little bit about the media and now we're going to talk about the, the equipment itself. So when we're trying to put a solution together, this is the solution is a combination of the chemical part and the physical part. So you might have a uh, application that only requires a thousand CFM of air based on the size of the room, but unfortunately your concentration of gases are so high um, that if you put one unit in there with a thousand CFM, you would have to change that media every, I don't know, a month, let's say. Um, so what you might want to do is actually increase the size of that unit, make the unit um, that would be equivalent to a five or 7,000 CFM unit. You still would put a blower in there for the 1,000 that you need, but you would have a, mo a lot more media to last you uh, six months or a year. So when we are putting a unit together, a solution together, not only we need to know the amount of contaminants that are in there, but we need to know the airflow and we need to figure out what is the best way to get that solution. You know, and it, it's going to be dependent on the customer. Uh, some customers have a lot more capital money 
uh, then they do maintenance. Therefore, what are you going to, the solution you're going to have for them, you're going to make a bigger unit so their maintenance is going to be in, in longer intervals. Uh, if my customer has a lot more maintenance money that, that they do capital money, then I'm going to make the unit with the low airflow, but they're going to have to spend a lot more time and a lot more money in maintenance and changing that media. So all those are the things that we have to think about when we're trying to get the right solution for the customer. So in regards to air scrubbing units, uh, there's two types. There's a modular type, and then there's a, what we call a deep bed scrubber type, a bulk filled uh, unit. So a modular type is just like this one, uh, these two right here, there's a side access housing and a PFU, and this is a module that goes inside of those units. So the media goes inside of that module, inside of the unit, it makes it very easy to, to change out the media, um, they're usually for, for lower concentrations of gases. Um, those are what you use for. The deep bed scrubbers are for higher concentrations of contaminants. So the deep bed scrubbers are what we use for bulk filled. So instead of having a container with the media in it, the whole equipment is the, is the container that holds the equipment. So this is a drum scrubber right here. Um, and this is a, a, a PBS, which is a pack bed system, and the media is in, in the whole side of here of the unit. So uh, deep bed scrubbers are our drum scrubbers, our uh, PBSs, our VBSs, um, VTSs, and, uh, and the radio flow units. So like I said, depending on what the concentrations are, the airflow, we're going to try to figure out what is the best solution and what kind of units to put out there. Today, we're going to talk about only about the package filter units. Uh, so there's two types, uh, well, three types. There's the standard one, which will be this one right here. And then there is a mobile and mini, which are smaller versions of that. So that's what we're going to concentrate on uh, talking about today. So, in regards to the PFUs, uh, where do we use them? Again, like I said, our applications and marketers are fast. So we're going to use them in industrial, commercial, mission critical, which is your data centers and municipal areas. Um, and a lot of the PFUs are either going to be for odor control or corrosion control, one or the other. So within those industries, for example, in the industrial market, you're going to have um, manufacturing plants, chemical plants, uh, petrochem, mining, uh, pulp and paper mills, steel manufacturing. Those all are all um, industrial sites that you're going to see these type of equipment in. In a commercial application, where do you see these units? You see in a morgue, you see in a hospital, you see in a police department, uh, like the evidence room, you see in gyms, you see in museums. So a nail salon, I mean, there's such a vast location that you can put those things in. Uh, it all depends on what the customer is looking for and how to best uh, select the equipment to go in there. Again, municipal and the corrosion uh, control, you have all these MCC rooms, the motor control rooms, um, mission critical and data centers, you're going to see any any place that has electronics, you're going to see corrosion issues. Therefore, you can put one of these units in. So I talked about the two different variants about how do we use the PFU. One is auto control. The other one is, is corrosion control. Those are the mainly the two things that we use it for. So odor control, you have internal or indoor uh, odors and you have outdoor odors. So indoor odors, you might have things that inside of a building, uh, even on a small construction, you might carpeting, adhesive, cleaning, cooking, bioeffluence, and you know, those like, for example, a gym, uh, have some gyms that use those units just because of the smell inside of the gym. 
or you have it in the school, or you have it in a lab. Um, so those are all odors that's coming from inside of the building and it's creating issue. Uh, for example, a morgue is, your, is a good one. There's a lot of formaldehyde in the morgue. So instead of letting that formaldehyde smell go around the building or in a, usually in a basement in a hospital, they will put one of those units in that will take care of that smell. Um, outside uh, odor sources, you're talking about industrial places, you're talking about commercial buildings, uh, exhaust from cars. If almost every one of the process industries and the heavy manufacturing industries apply with corrosion. Um, and so the, the corrosion, the odor, a lot of times they are kind of the go hand in hand. Not every time that you smell something, there's corrosion, but not every time that sometimes you don't smell anything, you do have corrosion. So, uh, so odors, again, it comes from inside, it goes from outside. Um, you might have uh, different sources of issues or problems. Corrosion. Uh, why do you have to worry about corrosion? Um, you have to worry about corrosion because they damage and they interrupt the electrical current um, flow into the signals of a board, which means you might have process control problems, you have communication problems, um, and it can be very expensive. So you have production loss. If a unit, uh, a piece of equipment is down because a board is not working, that means they are interrupting their plant and they're having costly component replacement and unscheduled downtime. So studies show that unplanned downtime on a single paper machine can cost up to $20,000 a minute. Uh, unplanned mill outage can cost up to a million dollars a day. And that, those are uh, numbers that came from uh, Evet Solution website. Uh, so I'm not making this up. So any time that you have unscheduled downtime, you're going to have issues. It's going to be expensive. Uh, you can even cause accidents. If a piece of equipment is running and you have an operator in that piece of equipment and all of a sudden it stops, um, it can be dangerous. So those are the reasons that corrosion is such a big um, problem that you have to take care of. And where do this corrosion occur? I mean, it, it, the amount of locations that that can occur is numerous. So you're talking about MCC rooms, any place they have drive rooms, uh, operator control rooms. So you're talking about if, even inside of a university, you might have, you know, all, all of their computers in one area. Well, if you have computers in one area, you have electronics. If you have electronics and you have corrosion, then some of the electronics going down because of the corrosion problems. Um, Pulp and paper mills, refineries, uh, chemical plants, um, any place that has electric motors in a central location is, you know, like the MCC rooms, you're going to have issues with. So those are the places that you're going to have to worry about. So what is corrosion control? So corrosion control is there's two... Um, things that affect corrosion. One is the atmosphere and the other one's the contaminant. So you have humidity, temperature, and salinity, and corrosive gases, vapor, and dust that will affect corrosion. So if I am worried about corrosion control and I just put a piece of equipment in there, but I don't take care of the humidity and the temperature, you're probably still going to have some problems. If you take care of the humidity and the temperature, and you're still having corrosion, then you might need to take care of the corrosive gases that are in there. Um, the temperature, when the temperature fluctuates up and down, is dramatically um, going up and down, it, it can create condensation. Uh, humidity also can cause the uh, gases contaminants to exponentially um, get worse. So just to give you an example um, of of a thing like that, 
in a data center inside of a hospital. Uh, at one point, they had a monitor, electric, electronic monitor, trying to figure out, you know, the ECM, trying to figure out what was the problem with their corrosion. And they would look at that unit through the day. The environment was fine. Everything was good. But somewhere around 2 o'clock in the morning, um, everything would go haywire. You know, the the environment would go to a GX environment, and I'll explain what that means. It's a very bad environment for corrosion, um, and they couldn't figure out why. Until one day, they decided to be there inside of that operating room, I mean, inside of that uh, data center to figure out what exactly was happening, because they were taking care of the humidity. They were taking care of the temperature, but every day at 2 o'clock in the morning, uh, they would have issue. So when they got there, they found out that the operator would take a break. And during that break, he was a smoker, so he would open the outside door so he could still see and hear all his equipment inside while he was smoking outside. So the door was open, humidity would go up, temperature would go up, um, corrosion uh, readings would go up. And then when he closed the door, you know, 30 minutes later, everything went back to normal. So that's when they figured out, okay, the, the issue is not, it's operator error. Uh, it's not the environment itself. They were doing everything right until somebody did something that uh, was creating some problems. So in regards to corrosion and protecting electronics, there are standards that um, we have to follow, that the customers have to follow um, to make sure that everything is taken care of. The reason the standards were created um, was because a lot of the electronic manufacturers uh, were having a lot of warranty issues um, because, you know, if something happens to their equipment is what within their warranty period, the customer was going back and said, this is not working, I need a new one. So all the electronic manufacturers were having to replace and spend a lot of money in regards to uh, replacing equipment when it was due to corrosion. So they got together and they came, come up, came up with a, a standard that was, I believe this was back in the 1940s or 50s, uh, that would say if your environment is not being protected and it's not being corrosion free, you, our equipment is not on the warranty. You're just negated the warranty on, on our piece of equipment. Therefore, we don't have to replace it. Um, so the ISA standards, the International Society of Automation, uh, they've that society was created in 1945, I believe. And they read corrosion in angstrom. So angstrom is one tenth of a billionth of a meter, a hundred millionth of a centimeter. So you're talking about things that we cannot see um, with naked eye. Uh, and there is how you know the environment has to be, if you look at a Siemens or a Honeywell or any one of those big uh, big companies that have uh, electronics and sell electronic material, you're going to see within their warranty statement says as long you know that we will do this as long as the the environment is maintained as a G1 environment. So the customers have to show that the environment is a G1 for them to replace that board or replace that piece of equipment or replace that electronic. So a G1 environment, um, a, it goes from, on the copper, it goes from 0 to 299 angstroms, and then on the silver is 0 to 199. Um, so when a G1 is what you strive for, you're trying to make sure that corrosion is not a factor uh, in being a problem for your piece of equipment or your electronics. So... It is based on a lot of studies. You can tell uh, on some of the gases, again, just because the G1 doesn't mean they're going to have these gases, but the, some of the most common ones. 
And that's how they nominated the, you know, H2SO2. So to, so to have less than three PPB parts per billion of H2S is a G1. Um, a G2 is a moderate uh, environment. So you have corrosion that's measurable. A G3 is harsh. So most likely you're going to see corrosion. And GX, uh, you, it's, it's just a question of, how long, but the electronic equipment is not going to survive that environment. So that gives you an idea of the amount of gases that we're talking about uh, in regards to corrosion. Now, this is just the gases phase. We're not talking about the temperature and the humidity. Those are other things that you have to worry about as well in regards to corrosion. So for standard practices for to take care of corrosion, you're trying to keep the temperature uh, stable. So you're trying not to go up and down um, more than two Fahrenheit up and down uh, because the rate of corrosion every time that you go up and down more than that, uh, the ex ex exponentiate the amount of uh, corrosion that creates. The humidity, you're trying to keep that humidity uh, around 50%. Um, Again, if you have more humidity and then you have, it's more likely that you're going to get um, more corrosion. And then maintain the amount of particulates. Of course, what we come in is the maintain the lower level of contaminants. That's what we do. That's what our solutions are. But we can do that by ourselves. The customers still have to take care of this other stuff. Um, other things that you have to worry about is the integrity of the room. So how the room is being, uh, was constructed and sealed. Um, so there's two trains of thoughts on how to do it. There's room pressurization and recirculation. Uh, room pressurization, usually when you try to pressurize the room, meaning when you open the door of that room, the inside air is going out instead of the outside air is coming in. Um, you're going to try to keep that room at 0.05 inches of water gauge to uh, 0.1 uh, of pressure. And that is a, roughly about three to six air changes an hour for that room. If you're doing recirculation, um, it's about six, 12 air changes an hour. And of course, you always have to maintain that room to make sure you have to maintain the media, you have to maintain, make sure the temperature maintains the same, the humidity maintains the same. Uh, the, the media is good. If the media dies and you don't do anything, then you're going to have issues. So the recirculation you're talking about, you need about 10 to 20 percent of the volume of that protected area um, to to keep a, a recirculation uh, calculation. Uh, well, I'll go back one more time. Uh, so in regards to, and we'll talk about a little bit of uh, room pressurization and recirculation. So you can pressurize the room or you can just recircle the room. Some of the issues with pressurizing the room, uh, which there's a lot of people that think that's the best way to do it. And it would be the best way to do it if um, all rooms were sealed properly with, I would say 90% of them are not. So uh, if they're not sealed correctly, then you will have problems because you're going to have to put a lot more air in there. Anyway, um, what I'm going to talk about again is our package uh, filter units. We have different types of units. And why do we use those units opposed to any other units? So they are pretty much a standalone unit. Um, so they don't require a uh, these units to be attached to a HVAC system. They don't require a lot of ducting. They don't require um, much of anything else except you put it in the room, you plug it in, you're ready to go. Um, so when you're pressurizing the room, you're trying to clean that room from the corrosive gases. So this will maintain the clean air inside of the room as a recirculation unit. Uh, it's self-contained um, and it's, you know, very, it's used for a, a low or a very low contaminant load. <clears throat> and it's just designed to be placed inside of that protected area. 
So a lot of these units are not going to be weatherproofed because they're expected in May to be inside of the room. There's different configurations and different types of PFUs. Um, so we have a PFU mini, a mobile, and then we have our standard PFUs, which is the 1,000, 2,000, 3,000. Um, have we ever done any other sizes? Absolutely. We've done a 500, we've done a 4,000, we've done a 6,000. That's when our expertise come in in regards to um, engineering things that best solution for the customer. But those are the standard. Uh, so a PFU mini and a mobile, uh, they are for very low amounts of contaminants. Um, they only have one pass of media um, that they are used for that. So the mini is a 500 CFM or 800 cubic meters per, per hour. The PFU mobile is a thousand uh, CFM. So as you see, the mini only has two cubic feet of media. The mobile has four. Um, the difference between the mobile and the PFU 1000, even though they are both 1000 CFM, the both have uh, four cubic feet of media. The again, the mobile um, has casters and is with trays. Um, the residence time on the on the PFU 1000 is a little longer. So it's used a lot more for a little industrial side. So some of the benefits of the PFUs, you have less footprint because they are vertical units. They are self-contained. They come with VFD or a, a variable control on the smaller units. They have low energy, low noise, uh, low noise, and they have a front door which makes it very easy to maintain and custom and, and change that. The PFU, the larger units, the 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, they're also customizable. So we can change some of the specs on that. So here are some pictures of the PFU mini and the mobile. This one right here on the left-hand side is the mini, the white one. Uh, you have one uh, cartridge of media in there. This is not your PP12s or PP18s. This is a special cartridge for this unit itself. You have a pre-filter and a final filter and a blower. So pretty much all the PFUs, what they have in common is that they have a pre-filter, a final filter, a blower, and chemical filtration. All of them will have that. Um, this is your PFU mobile. So this is 500 CFM, this is 1000 CFM. Um, both again, they are for recirculation, low energy and low noise. This is the inside of the PFU mobile uh, and the mini. This is the mini right here, this is the mobile. So this is the cartridge that goes inside of the mini. We got a pre-filter, a final filter right here and it's a research unit. The mobile have trays in them. Uh, again, it's top, uh, bottom to top, so the air is coming out. And they both have casters. So 500 CFM, 1000 CFM. A lot of these units are put in banks, commercial applications, um, some small control rooms, and uh, they're, they're standard, so a lot of times we'll have them in stock for uh, quick delivery. So, and they were used a lot uh, during COVID as well for um, protection because of the bacterial and virus and all that. So this is our 1,000 and 3,000 CFM PFUs. Um, this is a 1,000, it's actually at a... Um, uh, I believe this was an international paper um, location. As you can see, these two right here in the middle, they are actually not our standard. They are double wall units because that's what the customer requested. So this one not only has double wall construction, it has an extra layer of uh, pre-filter. So it has a pre-filter, media, intermediate filter, the final filter and then the blower. As I said, 
we can customize everything. Um, of course, you're better off if it's a standard unit, it's gonna be cheaper, um, but we can customize it. This is a PFU 3000, meaning it's a double bay. This one is also for restart. I don't know if you can see on, let me show you the next picture. Um, this, uh, the 1000 to 3000, like I said before, it can be a recirculation or a pressurization. So on the pressurization side, you're bringing outside air in and you're recirculating the air inside of that room. So this is outside air. You have a damper over here where you can adjust how much outside air is coming in and then the recirculation of the air in there. The recirculation, you're not bringing any outside air you're just recirculating the air inside of the room so you do not have a damper. So you can go uh, upflow or you can go downflow. Uh, we can make the, the changes, um, but that's how they are made. So the air will go, say it's downflow, will go from top to bottom, come out this way and just keep recirculating. This one, like I said, is a single bay. This is a double bay unit, meaning it's a bigger CFM unit. Um, sometimes the customer will request, you know, if they have a duct that they're, the unit's in one location, but it's being, um, they need the clean air in a different location and they have to go through a wall, you might have to, to duct this, the outside air going into that unit, going out this way and then duct back in. So there's, different things that you can do. Uh, like I said, this is a standard, but there's different ways to do that. We just have to know upfront of exactly how the unit's going to be used so we can make the unit accordingly so we'll, everything will work properly. Standard features. So the PFU Mini and the mobile are, they pretty much come as, as they're made. We don't do any changes on them at all. The 1,000 and 3,000, there is a standard. And then we also have optional features. And of course, anytime that you add features, you're going to add more money to it. But the reason that we have the features that we do, the standard features, is because literally that's all you need. But then if the customer wants something else, we can do it. So our standard is a single wall unit, painted cold raw steel. The reason that we do that is because it the single wall you don't re it's going to be inside so it's protected from the air it's protected from outside uh temperature um and it's already um the blower is has a noise uh foam in it so it's not that noisy so you really don't need a double wall but again if the customer wants a double wall we can do that um it's painted cold raw steel i've seen those units literally um, I've seen one year that has been out in a steel plant that was there for 40 years and it's still, and it was still working. So anyway, you want, to, if you want to do aluminum or stainless steel, can you do it? Yes, you can do it. We can put that in there. Usually they come with a single blower. Um, some customers have requested double blowers. It, again, it comes with a pre-filter, uh, two passes of the PP12s and a final filter. So we do Merv 8. Uh, PP12s and a um, bar 14. Um, and it comes with a VFD and then the gauges and of course the door on the front. So other things that we can do, optional things that we can do, and sometimes we'll do that because of specifications by other competitors. We can put matrix filters in there. We can do canisters in there. Uh, we can have a extra pass of particular filter. Uh, we can do either pressurization or recirculation. We can put an on and off starter in there. We can do upflow. We can do downflow. So those are all the different things that we can do with those units. Again, this is our standard, but we can do other things um, for those units. Uh, pressurization and recirculation, I touched base on that a little bit, and I showed you that the units are, uh, we can do either. So pressurization, the two the trains of thought over here is pressurization you have, if a room is well sealed and you have low pedestrian traffic, um, 
and you're trying to pressurize that room to 0.05 inches of water gauge to 0.1. Uh, it's about three to six air changes an hour. Recirculation is the room is not well sealed, the high, high pedestrian traffic um, or any of the control room um, walls are exposed to the outside. Reality is that, uh, like I said, 90% of rooms that we encounter are not well sealed. Therefore, and the other thing is it, when you're pressurizing, you're actually bringing uh, hot air in uh, inside of that room during summer, uh, especially in the Southeast. So now not only you're bringing dirty you're bringing the dirty air in that you're cleaning with the PFU, but also you're having to worry about the temperature. So if you're doing a recirc, the room is already to the right temperature. All you need to worry about is to make sure that that room is being cleaned um, and being uh, cleaned up all the time. So those are the things that you have to think about. Some of the basic designs that you can do, and this is not just our PFU, but the PFU can be part of a solution as well as the only solution. So if, you if you're pressurizing the room through a HVAC, uh, you're bringing some outside air, you're cleaning it, it's going through the HVAC, and you're only using the PFU as a research uh, inside of that room. Uh, because And why you do that is because people are going in and out of that room. Um, if you have an outside air that's heating and cooling, Again, you can do the pressurization, recirculation, and not go through there, but you're going to have issues here uh, because you're bringing hot air in or cold air in that has not been climatized to that location. So this is one way to do it. not saying it's the right way to do it. Um, other ways to do it is if you pressurize with other units going through the HVAC, and then you have our other units uh, doing research. Uh, you can do that with the PFU as well. The case studies that we have for our packaged uh, filter units, uh, we have used our we have used our unit at Christ Auctions at Auction House. Uh, those were PFU six thousands. Uh, they were huge units and they were mainly uh, used to protect arts uh, because the auction house will keep in their storage uh, some high value uh, art pieces of art from customers and they rent their space. So to protect their pieces of art, they use our units to um, keep the air clean. Um, and then another one, though, I'm trying to go a little faster because I know it's almost 11 o'clock and I do apologize. I talk too much. Uh, another one is our, uh, we used our PFU mini units at a Red Dog Mine. Um, I believe this is, a, uh, this is in Alaska. Uh, those were mainly used uh, during COVID. I mean, they're, I'm assuming they're still using it to cl clean the air inside of the mine but this is with our microsorb absorbent and that was to protect uh, the, the customers in there from their bacteria and, and viruses because that's what the potassium peranganate does. Um, it's really good for um, that kind of protection. So with that, uh, I'm going to leave it to you guys and see if there's any questions. Uh, 